Hi, this is Joanne, and welcome to Sit in the Attendee's Chair. Uh, today, we're going to be having our part three conversation on risk, but first, let's um, introduce everyone who's in the room, and uh, why don't we start with uh, Tracy? Hi, I'm Tracy Baer. I am a CMP. I am a CFMP, which is a certified faith-based meeting planner. Um, I work with a, a mega church here outside of Chicago. Thank you. And Meg, why don't you tell everyone about you? Hi, I'm Meg Caldwell. Um, I'm also a certified meeting professional. I am in the sales side of the hospitality industry, and I am with Beaver Run Resort and Conference Center in Breckenridge, Colorado. Yay. Um, Kelly? Hi, it's Kelly. I'm happy to be on again. I think everyone <laughs> knows who I am. <laughs> And, and for those of you who are wondering, Steve, or as he likes, Steve the Greater STG is not on today. So we will we will carry on without him. And uh, Linda, why don't you explain who you are? So Linda, <laughs> That's a loaded question. But anyway, right. there's what? no explanation for me. Um, <laughs> let's just jump right into this. Um, <laughs> because uh, people Robinson, are... Yes. I mean, if they if they listen to this out of order, they're just not going to understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're all too far gone at this point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Linda Robson, I am currently a professor at Endicott College teaching in events and hospitality. I was a meeting planner for a bunch of years. Um, as we said earlier, don't do the math. It makes you feel old and tired. Um but I have been studying risk, I guess, for somewhere around 20 to 30 years. It's something that just has always fascinated me. And, I, you know, that's interesting you would put it that way, because I think it does fascinate everyone, maybe sometimes in a macabre way. But, you know, it's just that, you know, it's a mixture of worry and we like the the tales of what happens when we're somewhere so it's it's kind of a combined thing and of course there's a, the worry will it happen and the worry what do should i have done or should i do to keep a lot of things from happening um yeah, so it's a, it's a big puzzle um and yeah i mean obviously a risk can manifest that is a terrible thing like a catastrophe injury death all of those things are terrible um, taking that part out of it, though, it's the the pre the pre thinking that is to me really fascinating. Trying to see how much I can actually understand things. And I think we talked a lot about that in the first two sections. You know, in terms of identifying and analyzing risk and things like that. And and today we go to um, the strategies part, which everyone knows. That's like one of my favorite words in the world. Put strategy, goals, and objectives. Begin with the end in mind. These are like words I live on. Um, but I wanted to make one aside. So this is uh, middle of June. What year are we in? Twenty twenty three. And uh, last week, all of you were, you know, big discussion in the house with Steve and everything when. Um, the one medical association ended up with the person who walked up to one of the panelists and, you know, berated him. And I forget if he actually physically touched him or not. I think yeah. he did, right? Yeah. And just, and, you know, the first thing I thought of was last year, well, with Salman Rush, Salman Rushdie being actually stabbed horrifically at uh, Chautauqua and then uh, the actress who was served her divorce papers why she was on stage and you go how the heck you know and so here we got this one going on and you know first question is are these registered attendees and if so that's a whole other thing so it's just interesting because you know to your to your point of we think of things like death or serious injury which certainly being stabbed is but um you know there's all these other things just things as you talk about in your book and you talk about with the kids and you talk about you know um there's just so many things and i think one of the things i really appreciate you talking about both in the book and on this podcast and that we've all been talking about is is the concepts and how it can apply to so many things uh really extreme things and things that it just never would occur to you would happen period like someone oh, going up yeah. and 
Yeah, wouldn't occur to you, shouldn't occur to you. <laughs> right, because yeah. we actually think people know how to behave at an event. Um, yeah, well, there's always Jeremy. So yeah. why, why don't you start talking about what do you mean by risk strategies? You know, I mean, to me, I would have said strategy was everything we were talking about, but you're talking about some very specific things. And if you want to do a recap of the, you know, the key points that we talked about before that got us to strategy, by all means, feel free. Sure. So we're talking about the model that I created, the Rob Summers Management Model. Um, it still feels weird to name something after myself, <laughs> but it, I, I mean, people were stealing it. And mm-hmm. it was like, are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, happy to, I'm, I'm happy to share it, but I mean, give me some credit for it. I worked hard. Um, so this model is um, five pieces and it's not, I, it's a process. It's not steps. It's not linear in any way. Um, you should be going back and forth through this. And so for the sake of explaining it, we typically start with the idea of personal risk perception um, and understanding who you are and how you look at the world so that you understand your bias or any biases that you may have. Then the next part of the process is risk identification that is primarily done through brainstorming Um, and mind mapping, so you start to get some organization, and then you go into the risk assessment where you quantify that subjective list of um, items that you identified and you start to go through and look at them in terms of probability and severity, so how likely is something to happen and what's the reasonable worst case scenario. All of these pieces of the process are meant to help you organize your thoughts. It's not a matter of saying this is the most important risk. And in the book, I make a point of saying, avoid saying this is the most important because any kind of language like that suggests that if you, if something else happened that ended up being catastrophic that you hadn't identified or prioritized, you could get into trouble in that th- with that in a court of law. So it's just a matter of here's how I can approach risks. And that's where we get to now the risk strategies. So, yes, Joanne, it is a strategic process. Uh, but the strategies are the things that we do um, if a risk manifests. So we're going through, we're going through these um, assessed risks and we're applying a way to deal with them if, if and when they manifest. Um, so, so strategy, I see what you're saying. As yeah. opposed to strategic, it's the strategy of how we would deal with it if it happened. Like Correct. what we would do, the logistics, the, okay, Correct. gotcha, yeah. good, good, thank you. That helps me yeah. think differently too. Again, it's very, it, the whole model is meant to be proactive. So all of this is done prior to boots on the ground. Um, and it does... Again, my focus for this book is to try to get people in what I call a risk management frame of mind, um, understanding that we're not ever going to identify all the risks. There's there's no way that we can. And to your point, Joanne, that idea of, you know, the crazy person on the 10th floor or the panelist that goes up and starts beating on someone or anything like that, we can't anticipate that because we're not crazy. Um, so. Well, it goes back to your, you know, your whole thing of perception, because we're yeah. trying to filter everything the way we would think and act. And of course, that's where your right. snake story comes in. Yes. But, you know, I think also with all of our expanded learnings on neurodiversity, we have to realize every single person, to a certain extent, perceives everything differently, because it's all the pieces of what shows up yeah. in us. So I do. I mean, your perceptions and who you are as a person has so many different components to it and I talk about this in my class um, the idea of risk perception um, and I think I talk about it in in the book it's been a while since I read that section of it Um, but there's a piece that when you're dealing with perception it's influenced by culture it's influenced by your social groups by your upbringing by your education by your experience and so you might we mo- they might have two people that are afraid of something or perceive something in a very similar way, but there'll be nuances that we won't know. Um, so again, the idea behind the book is to try to be as proactive as we can and to offer ourselves 
to offer our attendees and our uh, supplier partners and everybody on site a a degree of safety and security, but also to give us some comfort that we have been thinking about risk management. And so if something happens that we hadn't identified, we still have gone through the whole thought process. We're going to be able to deal with it in a more effective way than if we had just been reactive, which I think is what a lot of times uh, we rely on as event professionals. You know, it's interesting. I was just um, at SGMP and I was in a session about risk management. And one of the things that I just, it really kind of, I don't know if it was a a bee in my bonnet or a burr in my shoe, but it was that it was kind of left as you're never going to know, you're never going to be able to anticipate everything, which makes sense. But there wasn't, I was looking for that answer to, okay, well, well, that's, that's true, but what do we do? So I love the fact that you're focusing on reaction. You know, even though you might not anticipate that particular situation, if you if you have some kind of plan, then everybody can move forward and handle what happens. So I think that's hundred really percent answer to, to my my frustration. I, I don't have a better word for it as to you know. Oh my gosh, you're right because I'm a warrior. We can't, we can't anticipate everything. We're, we're done. There's no solution. <laughs> That's not true. It's a point that I make in the book as well is there's no such thing as a risk-free environment. Like, it, you just, it, you can't. There's no such thing because there's no way to anticipate all of the things that could go wrong. And so, again, I focus on the idea of removing those definitive words or inclusive words in any documentation. So, you're not ever going to say, I identified all the risks. No. These are the risks that I identified, and here's why I identified them. Like, here's my logic. So the whole process focuses on being proactive, um, being thoughtful, and also explaining your logic. Because the other part of it is there's five of us on this on this podcast today, and there are five different ways of dealing with something, and nothing is none of them are, is necessarily wrong. I don't have to agree with you. I have to understand why. All right. Um, which is something that's hard for people to understand as well. It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this so that you agree with me. I'm doing this so that you understand why I made this decision. And if you agree with me or not is irrelevant. <laughs> you understand why. And then we can have a conversation. If you think I'm wrong, you, we can have a conversation about how to change it. And all of that is a piece of risk management. Communication is huge, huge, huge. You know, one of the things I'm thinking about, like when I teach, especially, you know, the CMP material and everything, I talk a lot about concepts that, you know, uh, because the exam is about concepts, not memorization. And that one concept answers 10 questions, or at least part of 10 questions. And I think that's kind of what I hear you saying, too, is if you understand these concepts behind each of these steps, and how they go back and forth, it almost doesn't matter what the incident is. Yes. If you ha- understand the concepts, you will know what to do. Yeah. I mean, in terms of what I call action plans, which mm-hmm. are connected to the idea of strategies, um, the, in terms of the action plans, you really only need three. You need evacuation. You need, uh, I call it a stay in place. It's also called shelter in place. And you need medical. Those are the three action plans you need to deal with those three incidents. Those three action plans can then be used for a variety, to your point, a variety of different concepts, right? So you would tweak it. A medical action plan would deal with, you would create one that would deal with the reasonable worst case scenario, and then you can just pull back from that. So you would deal with somebody who is who is dying, and then you can go down from that to like a paper cut, right? Um, so thinking about the reasonable worst case scenario and how we would deal with it allows you to then modify it in order to be able to deal with what comes up. Yeah. Sorry, I'm thinking. That's why I'm like, <laughs> like yeah, let me think on this for a minute. Yeah. I have a feeling other people are doing the same. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, Strategies. Strategies, yeah. (laughs) Strategies. So 
Um, in the research that I did, there's a variety of different types of strategies that you can use. Um, and there's, there's a ton of them out there. And some people have a variety of them. I like four, that, which is what's in the book. Um, it, those four to me seem inclusive. And like everything else, when I talk about risk management is I'm giving you my, my strategies and my um, logic, and then you should adapt it so that you can absolutely use, and that's why I wrote the book, absolutely use whatever it is that I put in the book. Um, but you should make sure that it's customized to you. So the four strategies that I chose are avoid, retain, uh, transfer. Oh God, what's the fourth one? Reduce. <laughs> Reduce. <laughs> Thank you. I every time there's only four, and I still every time I do it, I always forget Good one. Thing of them. You didn't do six or seven. You know that would have been really <laughs> right. <laughs> there's no way I'd have remembered six or seven. Uh, so, but those are the four that that I decided to use. Um, and so the way that it breaks down is an avoid strategy is when you've got, so if you think back to risk uh, um, identification, part of that mind mapping, what we did was we put the risk connected to an element of the event, right? So if you're talking about rain, it could be um, inside, right, in the, in the foyer. So you connected it to an element of the event. When you use an avoid strategy, what you're doing is eliminating the element that would result, that could result in the risk manifesting. So you're either getting rid of it, you're modifying it, or you're substituting it. This is not a strategy that we use very often as event professionals. Because in order to change something to the element, it means that it needs to not be a critical part of the event. And any event professional who's good at their job is not putting crap into an event that isn't useful and isn't necessary, right? So the example I put in the book was back to that children's event. We had a variety of different activities that there were agricultural-based activities for the kids to do. One of them was a pulley system. It was demonstrating a pulley system, and it was made out of bricks and blocks. Well, you can imagine what... Bricks? bricks doing with bricks and blocks. I just remembered uh, you said bricks, and I'm thinking yep. like real bricks. Yep, yep, like the red bricks that you make out of you, that you used to make houses with. Um, yep. So, and it was made <laughs> out of wood, and there were bricks and blocks, and it showed how to use the pulley system. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you can imagine that these. It was primarily the boys that were doing it. They started throwing them. <laughs> yep. Um, hadn't thought of that. Had I should have, but had not have thought of you that. You have boys. <laughs> I have boys. I should have thought of that. However, you know, you just, they're, they're being chaperones. You know, you would hope that the chaperones would stop them from throwing bricks. That would be something they would do at home, but not in public, in a public you event. Because kids have yeah. these borders, right? And Meg's yeah. going, yeah, right. Yeah. Yep. And, it's, and again, it's not like these kids are just running rampant through. They have chaperones. They have parent chaperones with them. But whatever. Um, so the, these kids were throwing the bricks, and one of the staff radioed me. It's like, you need to come here now. So I went over and I saw that this was happening. And so what did I do? I took it apart and took it and took it out of the event because it wasn't a crucial element to the event. So I could have substituted it with something else. I could have altered it so that I used, was not using bricks. Um, but it was a non-crucial element to the event, so I just removed it. There were other activities they could do. It wasn't, it wasn't something they needed, so I just took it out. Um, so that's an example of how to use an avoid strategy. And as I said, we don't use it very often because most event professionals don't include stuff in an event that isn't critical to the execution of the event. So then the next one is um, reduce. We live here. This is where we live. So this is when you use what we call protection, protection strategies. Um, so what you're doing is you're reducing the potential for um, injury and, and or damage. So you're reducing the severity and you're reducing the probability of it happening. 
The example of that is what do we do when we've got wires running in an event? We tape them down. So people don't trip over them so that the machines don't get pulled off, whatever. So by taping down wires, we're using a reduced strategy. We cannot eliminate, like we can't remove that element from the event. So what we have to do is make it safer. Um, and then we have the um, tra- uh, no, not tra- retain. Sorry. Retain. Retain. Yep. Retain is the next one. Um, so retain is the thing. These are the things that we can't necessarily predict with any certainty. And we really can't do anything until it manifests. So think weather. Right. Mm-hmm. They can predict a storm, but they don't know how bad it is, whether or not it's going to happen. So we know that there's the chance that it ha- could happen. We have identified the probability range. We've identified the reasonable worst case scenario, but now we just have to wait, right? And if it happens, then, excuse me, then we're going to do something, but we've been, so we proactively planned for something that we are then going to react to if it happens. So again, like I said, rain. Um, And for example of this is I just went to Endicott's graduation a few weeks ago, and they've been calling for rain all week. And our graduating class is too large. We don't have a we don't have a facility that will fit everyone. So rain or shine, it was outside. Um, and of course, it started to rain. So what did they do? They had um, raincoats, plastic raincoats, that they passed out to us. When it's just as it started to rain, that was passed out. So you accept that it could happen, and you have a way to deal with it if it does. So that's a that's a retained strategy. We have to make sure when we're using a retra- retained strategy that we're not just going, yeah, whatever, you know, okay, whatever. We still have to go through the process of doing the assessment and figuring out what we're going to do, how we're going to react to it. Um, and then the, the transfer, <coughs> excuse me, the transfer strategy, we also live here. This is when we realize that we are not we don't have the qualifications and skill set to be able to deal with a risk that manifests. So we give it to somebody else to deal with. So medical emergencies, um, mostly F and B, we do this with alcohol, um, those types of things. And so what we do is create a contract with supplier partners. And we're now saying to them, tag, you're it. You're responsible for this. What we have to make sure that we've done is our due diligence and our um, our responsibility is to make sure that we've researched who it is that we're transferring the risk, the responsibility of the risk to, so that we know that they are capable. So we're asking for things like certifications, any kind of permits and licenses they need. So we have to have researched them. This one is for event professionals, specifically event planners, the hardest one to do. Because when we tag a supplier partner in, we have to keep our grubby little hands off it. We have transferred this risk saying we, are, we do not have the skill set. We are not capable of looking after this, right? That's what's in the contract. That's what the contract implies. If we then step in and deal with it, we're accepting that liability back, So, which puts us in a very bad position. So, for example, with alcohol. We see people getting drunk. We can't cut them off. We have to go to whoever our contact is for the bar and say, look, you need to deal with this, right? We want to put it in writing saying, look, I'm telling you there's an issue, but we can't do it. So that's, that's the, the trickiest part with a a transfer strategy. You know, that's interesting because um, like two of the examples I always give for that is um, one, children, having a children's program, which, you know, when I started really being involved in this industry 20 years or more, children, there were still children's programs frequently at events. And I also heard some real horror tales about people bringing children and dumping them on the meeting planner and at the registration table and horrible, horrible things like that. Yep. Um, but You know, there, I don't know if these, I'm sure there are companies, but we used to see them at the trade shows. There were a couple of key companies that worked with meetings and conferences to create a multi deer day child age specific program. They were all, you know, obviously they had been 
background, you know, check. They had, you know, programs for zero to two, three to five. Like they knew all the appropriate stuff. And I always said to people, stop thinking you can do this. No, you can't. No, you don't. And you don't want to mess with anyone's children. That's one of the key things I know. I, you know, and, you know, is ironically, and the other one's outdoor activities, which I'm going to say one more thing on it in a minute. But here's the thing. We, so many people in our industry go, oh, well, I get, you know, I got kids at home. or I got nieces and nephews. I can do a kids program or I can do outdoors. I hike and everything. And it's like, you have now said the same thing that you get pissed off about other people saying about meetings and events. Oh, how hard can it be to get a room and some coffee? You know, you have just diminished them in the same way that you hate to be diminished in. And I'm yeah. like, no, you can't. And uh, uh, <clears throat> prior to this podcast, I was discussing our recording or lack thereof of the one on outdoor activities, which we will be re-recording since it wasn't on the desk. <laughs> but um, Tracy and Meg were both involved with that with Linda Finkel. And uh, Tracy, you wrote a blog about that. What was one of your biggest like, whoa? The, um, the hiking lady. Um, she was a, an outdoor uh, re- rescue person. Certified, and, yeah, certified yeah, medical, like, yeah. certified EMT for outdoors. I don't know what the correct. It was some, yeah, I can't remember the the term, but it was like a very specific um, outdoor woodsy hiking rescue mountain lady, and she was amazing. But I live in Illinois; it's flat here, <laughs> so I don't think about a mountain ever. And if yep. I were to take a, a group to, if I were to plan an event in Colorado, yes, there's mountains there. I am still not thinking about bringing along. A hiking rescue lady. I'm gonna. We're all gonna go for a hike, and I'm gonna take a you know water bottle and some hiking boots. I'm gonna be very ill, Ill prepared for this trip. Yes. So yes. I am going to need some assistance with coordinating this trip because it is just not something that I'm thinking about. Right. And yeah, and we tend to do that. So if it's something that is that we do on a regular basis, we tend to not think about having an expert in that area if it's something that we haven't done before that's when we're reaching out so yeah it's i mean i think that's just human nature yeah but i mean i think having that expertise and you know meg was sharing about all the outdoor activities they have at at their facility both winter and and well year round and just the concerns and of course you know if i see one more thing video posted of some idiot what is it, uh, Linda? People are stupid. People are like stupid. being by a bison or a moose in the state parks and then sadly oh. causing the death of one or two of the babies because of it. It's like, no, 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 no. There's a yeah. reason they're in the wild and you are not. You know, like. <sighs> well, it's the same as the dumbasses you see when you used to go to those um, safaris and they stick their arm. They're feeding the animals outside. There's a reason that they tell you to keep. They're wild animals. Like, what is wrong with you? That sign actually applies to everyone. Yeah, you're not, not the exception to the rule. And I think yeah. I think we all run into that, you know, with meetings and events. And I always try to make sure, like, if I go to do something anywhere, I'm like, am I trying to be the exception to the rule and piss off someone? <laughs> you know, um, because we have all these people. We have all the signage. We have keys. We have name tags. We have whatever we've done. The bus leaves then or we will leave you there. And they think they're the exception to the rule. And I guess we all do it at some point point but sometimes it's a bigger issue than others you know like getting out taking a selfie with a moose that's quadruple your size yeah i think we all do things um we all do stupid things sometimes because we're all of us human but i i think for me sometimes the stupid things i do is because i haven't read something and you know you can put signs everywhere and people will not see them. And it happens. But the idea of, like you said, getting out of a car and walking over to a wild animal, that takes some thought, right? Like, and what is the thought? Because, wow, like really wow. Yeah. Yeah. There's times where you watch people do stuff and or you hear that people have done stuff. And the only thing I can think of is, please tell me there was alcohol involved. Right. That you're not just that so there's an stupid. excuse right yeah. or at least an explanation not an excuse but an explanation yeah. meg you were going to say something yeah it never occurred to me that 
a lot of our Colorado meeting planners and they come a lot. And so they, it, it's, it's inherently known because they've been here before, but it never occurred to me that risk management where I am involves wildlife. It just snapped when you said that. And I, I see it all the time. I yell at my car. They're dangerous. You need to back up. Um, they'll charge because, you know, somebody standing two feet away from a mama moose with two babies. Mama is the worst. Probably weekly it happens. Seriously? Um, no, but yeah, back away. They're dangerous. Or I see somebody in my neighborhood that's in a short-term rental. I don't recognize them. They have a dog. And I'll say, hey, just keep in mind, I just saw a moose. And they just look at me bewildered. Like, what do you mean? As and then I'm like, really should turn around. <laughs> it happens all the time. But it never occurred to me that part of the risk management where my resort is located is truly is wildlife. We have them on property. We have moose on property all the time. Yeah. Well, and think about like um, chicken or not chickens, but like ducks, geese. 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 Are oh, yeah. Geese are oh, yeah. Mean. You know, swans are worse. But geese, so when I was going to university in Canada, University of Waterloo, and I went to go to class one day, and there's this big sign right outside the parking lot that said, don't use this door, the geese have had babies. And I'm like, cool, right? I grew up in Canada. I'm familiar with with what you call a Canada goose, but like the geese, I'm familiar with them. They're me. So I walk around and I walk around to the other building and I watch some idiot who thought that sign didn't apply to them walking towards the doors. And then I saw him running the other way with the geese chasing him. It's like, yeah, you know what? I kind of hope that you, if they catch you because big sign. Right? Like, what do you think is going to happen? And so... I guess people, and of course, because of the whole selfie thing and everything people have become, I mean, look how many, I've read statistics of how many people die taking selfies in the course of a year, and it's just staggering, you know, falling off cliffs, falling into water, falling, you know, being places because they want to get that perfect selfie or with a moose or a bear or or whatever it is, but... What do you mean they're not stuffed and cuddly? (laughs) Yeah, like, oh, they won't hurt me. Do you know they can run like, you know, yeah, yeah. Way faster than you. They can run faster than you. They may be big and they may look slow, but oh, not when you're in their territory, that's for sure. You know, and bears can climb right like yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and no i'm not going to sit there and sort out is it a black bear or a brown bear or is it a whatever bear because yeah. some you do one thing and some you do another i'm just not going to go close enough to find out you Correct. know just really yeah. not but meg that's interesting that you just had this aha moment uh which makes me that that's a really cool thing for you to actually talk to your meeting planners the business you all book your whole department like this needs to be in the know before you go. Yep. Well, and what is our process as a as a property when we know that there's a moose in the willows right off our path? Like, have we thought about that? How we communicate that with our guests and our groups? Because I I kind of feel like that's part of what we, you know be like oh, be like any other hazard. Um, you know, an icy spot or yep. whatever. All of a sudden, we have uh, you know what. 3,000 pound bull moose 10 feet away from our patio and our guests are out there taking pictures. <laughs> okay, Linda just I, almost fell off her chair. but I, mean, but. I, I just don't understand it. I, I mean, maybe it, I, I just don't, I don't understand people's fascination and lack of fear with wild animals. I don't get it. Yeah. I think because a lot of them have only seen them maybe in zoos. And even those zoos, huge. They're huge. Like I'm not. I'm six feet tall. I'm not going up to something that's bigger than me that lives in the wild. Part of it is is, it's a not a stigma. I don't know the word for it, but it's like one of the things that is cool. Like my parents were up here in uh, last summer, and we were really excited that they got a trifecta. They saw moose, they saw fox, and they saw bear, all from protected, safe places. But they got to see those. And that's like part of coming here. Just like if you go to Alaska or somewhere like that, it's like, wow. Or you go to Africa. Wow, I got to see a lion. It's this, they ask all the time, where can I go to see the moose? Well, they're wild animals, so there's no answer for that. But it's it's part of the experience. And so some people just, but I, I agree. I've seen one standing next to my Toyota minivan. And 
there's no way I'm going anywhere near one. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think animals are gorgeous, and I would love to go up north and see a polar bear from inside mm-hmm. a vehicle. <laughs> like I, I, I'm just I've seen I've seen the sheep. Um, I was in Calgary, Alberta, for an event, and you know you see the big horn sheep, and again people are driving right up to them. You see those big horns, right? Like, have you never seen a wildlife show? Where they bang each other with that, you know, like, again, I just, I don't understand what the thought process is of let me get out and go over to this that I can't communicate with and tell them that I'm not doing anything dangerous. Right? <laughs> like, I just, I don't understand it. I just don't understand it. I think a lot of people just people. don't know a lot about animals. Tracy. They're not just stupid with animals. Like here in oh. Illinois, one of the things that we have to risk assess for is tornado. And oftentimes at an event, you know, we'll have a tornado threat and we've got to go inside and all that. What are the first, they run outside. I want to see it. Are you kidding me? It's a tornado. (laughs) Do you know what that can do to you? You can end up in the next county if you're not careful. Like, no, don't go outside. And it won't be Oz. It will not be Oz. This will not, you know. I mean, I used to tell, and I tell the students this, I I told my boys this growing up. The reason that there are warning labels on stuff is because somebody has done it. One of my favorites is on an iron. It says, don't iron clothes while wearing them. You have to be a special kind of stupid. Right? (laughs) And honestly, I think the way that we solve a lot of the problems in the world is just take the warning labels off stuff. Let them go. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's it's crazy. When, like I said, the, the one that struck me the most ridiculous was the don't iron clothes while wearing. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> but it, yeah, I mean, again, you're, you're talking about things like people doing these types of things that you just can't even imagine. And you, you, even when they do it, you can't understand why they would. So that's a, a really tricky part with doing risk management is trying to get into people's heads, and we can't. Right. So we just have to be as inclusive as we can and as broad as we can and hope that when people decide to, to find a new level of stupid, that our risk management plan, we, we're in a risk management frame of mind and we can now adapt it to deal with that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, sidebar, a great place to learn about people doing because they think they're the exception or they don't understand um you know when i go on my tears of watching the weather channel for a long time and they now have because of all their technology able to show things like no no if there's one inch it can do this to you and if there's three inches and no there's a reason it says do not drive through here you know that you will be swept into you know, an abyss somewhere and yeah. and especially areas that aren't used to flooding and then suddenly flood. We were reading about one down in um, Arizona and they actually, they call them like the, the stupid markers or something uh, under the um, overpasses where they have marks saying, if it's this high, like, you know, like, no, no, no. Um, and it, it just so many things you read about and they talk about people going out to the weather and, you know, I've noticed everywhere now is really emphatic about lightning this i noticed this maybe about five six years ago if the lightning comes it is it's a non-negotiable you go you go inside a a building and you do not go out until 30 minutes after the last strike period you know and i don't remember ever hearing that like i know people stayed outside oh you know there's a storm coming on and it's like under the tree let's go under the tree yeah (laughs) That too. That's that's always been a problem. So I mean, well, I grew up. I grew up playing softball, and I was a I was a catcher. So I had all the equipment on. And when it started to thunder and lightning, I'm like, I'm out. And the umpire would be like, No, no, we're just going to wait it out, dude. I'm covered in metal on an <laughs> open field. Are you kidding? No, <laughs> you go ahead, Great. <laughs> you go ahead. Well, and, and a lot know, of bats are, are aluminum, are aluminum. <laughs> too, so yeah, just like a, golf a clubs. <laughs> open field and holding metal. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> Golfers, that's always been a big issue on the golf course, too. Yep. You know, them holding and then going into the trees again yep. for... Uh, 
So, Meg, we will be interested to hear, but I am thinking, boy, that is a good thing for you to communicate yeah. with your meeting planners who, who contract with you. Like, no, this is for real. You need to put this in your no before you go. You need to put this in your safety, yeah. and we yeah. need to put up signs. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. But so, again, it's one of those things that, Meg, you, grew, you live there, so you're used to it. It's not even something that you think about. Um, but yeah, and it and it happens, and there's nothing. As as you go through a risk management process, every time you do it, you should think of something new. Which is again one of the reasons that it fascinates me is that every time I talk about risk, I I learn something new, and I think about a new way of looking at something. And so it's again, it's a, a way to learn so much, and it's it's just really gratifying to do. But, you know, even going back to your, uh, you know, when you were talking about perception and how we perceive when we sit down and so much of it comes from ourselves. So, you know, Tracy made an excellent point. She lives in flat western Illinois, you know, up by the lake. Mountains, all those things. The, the, you know, she could tell you tornadoes. She could tell you snow, probably, wind, all those things. But if it's not what you experience on a day-to-day basis... It doesn't dawn on you or the wild animals or like Meg, you've lived both down at the Gulf Coast, which I think is where you were raised and you worked there for a long time before you moved to uh, to Colorado. So like, did that shift your perception before to even before today of like, oh, here's something I never thought of when I lived in Alabama that I need to be more aware of in terms of safety and things like that. Yes. Yeah, of course. You know, in lower Alabama, it's hurricanes. Um, Tornadoes sometimes, flooding is one. Then when I lived in middle Alabama, it was tornadoes, constant tornadoes. And then I move out here and now I don't have to worry about tornadoes, but I have to worry about moose and bears, (laughs) snow, (laughs) that sort of thing. Well, and the other thing that you need to consider is that, so you've got people that are coming there and haven't experienced that. So Tracy, you know, people with tornadoes, um, (laughs) You've got the, the dummies that'll go out and try to get close to it, but you'll also have people because it's not something that they've ever heard of or experienced or that they've heard of it, but they've never experienced, you could end up with one of that fight, flight, or freeze moments, right? Because it's something that they're unfamiliar with, so their reaction to it is going to vary greatly as well because it's it's a new experience. Well, if they're standing in near the siren, that thing right. pierce your ears. I mean... Mm-hmm. So yeah. that, I mean, if they've got a, a sensory issue, I can see yep. that being a, a definite fear. Yep. Yeah. Well, I know the so first time yeah. I was in significant, so I had to fly to, um, oh God, where was I? Omaha. I went to Omaha. And as we were landing, you know, and, and coming in, like the landing was a little rough. And then we're driving to the hotel in a van and other people who were going to the same thing i was you know we're in it and like trash is blowing all over and and the driver goes oh yeah we're under tornado alerts and (laughs) i'm like terrified never really having been in tornado alerts and you know whoever you talk to like they act like it's the most normal thing oh yeah we get hurricanes a number of times a year or whoa we get tornadoes or earthquakes not even a problem so we're in this high rise in omaha which was probably only 10 or 11 feet but in omaha that was pretty high and the opening uh, night we were in the top floor, which was completely glass enclosed. <laughs> and the storm is playing out and no one else is reacting. And I'm going, I really am thinking, I don't know how thick this glass is. I get it. It's been built. And it was the first time I'd ever seen in my hotel room, like instructions for a tornado. I had never had that happen before. But being up there and watching it on all four sides of the glass, like play out I mean, I guess we there wasn't one right there. I don't know if one ever hit, but it was terrifying. And and yeah. I'm thinking, am I the only one who thinks this maybe is it? And they were all people in the industry too, but that's a whole other thing, you know. But am am I the only one that thinks this could be a problem that we're on the <laughs> highest floor in a completely glass enclosed room and we're under major storm alerts, including maybe tornadoes? <laughs> eh, maybe it's me, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you do wonder if you're overreacting sometimes. Yes. <laughs> I I go with my instinct. It's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not feeling warm and snuggly here. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm done. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. also the kind that empties a building if 
any kind of alarm goes off. Um, that one will always stick with me for many reasons. Yeah. So, um, okay, so we talked about the four different ways to, you know, build a strategy. Yep. Yep. So each, the, another piece with the strategies is that each risk that you have ad- identified and assessed now needs a strategy put with it. Uh, and you cannot use more than one. You have to pick one of those four. So you can't, because you can't transfer a risk and reduce it, right? So you're, you're going to do one and only one. Um, and the idea is that, so if you're going to retain a risk, the idea is that what you've done proactively is plan for it to manifest and then you leave it alone, right? If you're going to reduce the risk, then you've done something proactively to reduce the um, severity and the probability. So again, it's the whole model is very proactive. Um, So you can't like you can't avoid a risk and reduce it because if you're avoiding it, you're taking that element away. You're making a change to that element. So you can't reduce it. You might make decide to make the change and then you have to reassess that. And then you might apply a, a reduce to it, but you can't, you cannot do two strategies or a risk. So if you create a plan B, you also need to look at what strategy might be Correct. attached to plan B. Correct. So if, if, if your first choice you ended up avoiding, that was your strategy for plan A, then you move to plan B, but you may need to reevaluate and pick one of the others. Right. Hopefully not Any, avoid because otherwise you didn't really accomplish much right. by changing it. But anytime that there's a change to the event, you have to go back through and look to make sure that you've identified and assessed anything that has changed. So if they're adding something to the event or they're removing something or changing the timing, you have you have to go back. You don't have to start again like from the beginning of the whole event. What you're doing is taking a look at that new piece. And making sure that your risk identification and assessment still fits. Okay. Yeah. That's like what we were talking about with the outdoor events and living here in Illinois. We always have to plan two events. You can't do an outdoor event and that just be your only thing. You right. have to have an indoor option. So you, right. you're always doing both here. Right. And the, the risks and what you would do are going to be significantly different than outside than inside. So, yeah, you have to have... Anytime you make a change to the event, add, delete, change, whatever, you have to go through and make sure that your identification and assessment and your strategy still apply. Because you know when you put something new into an event, it's not just living in a bubble. It's affecting everything else around it. Yeah, a ripple effect. Yep. One change has a, a ripple effect for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, just thinking about, okay, plan B, you know, tagging something to it, plan C. I mean, we joke. We have a plan A, B, C, D half the time for almost everything, you yeah. know, especially major things. So, uh, And one of the things that I do see with event planners is that they'll go through an event professionals, they'll go through a risk management process of some sort um, because I very, very, very firmly believe that anybody who's an event professional is always thinking about risk management. Um, we can always learn more, but we are always thinking about it. But what I think is is a detriment is that we make changes and don't think about risk management. We It's like risk management, we did our plan, good, we're done. And then we make changes to the event and the risk management plan may not be able to be executed the way it was supposed to be. It adds Even another risk. minute changes. Correct. It adds another risk, right? Your risk management plan now isn't, going to be effective and could end up making things worse which actually we probably could have run into i had an event that we were using um three sections of a ballroom for a general session and we planned as you know done all the meeting space and everything got on site and the production team had actually planned it for four sections of ballroom and the only way we were going to make the event fit was to use all four sections so we had to change what was in that fourth section move it somewhere else use all four sections so that would have that would have changed our evacuation plan it would have changed everything that happened with the room that what you know where did that room go yep. we had to do like a little juggle of who was where it, it would have changed our entire plan yeah mm. yeah well look at, like right then 
Well, and then you have the, and yeah, that's always fun when it's on site and you get news like that. But I'm also thinking about the conferences that for various reasons or conferences, meetings, events, lumping them all together are having to change whole cities. I, I'm always amazed like when they, they do that a, a couple months out. I mean, a year out. Yeah. Six months out. Maybe all those, some of your attendees are going to be ticked, especially if, you know, they've already made plans around it. But these ones that are moving out within a couple of months for a variety of reasons, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, talk about changing everything. Well, yeah, I actually, so one of the last events that I did as a, a, an event professional was in Ottawa, um, Canada. And when I was doing the site inspections, I looked at the convention center. And, of course, one of the things I asked is, what have you got planned in terms of renovations, construction, whatever? And they were going to do an overhaul on the convention center. So, and it was, it was going to be a six-month process. And we decided ultimately not to use the convention center because the client wanted it in a hotel so that you could have the room block, better negotiation, all of that stuff. So we ended up not going with the convention center. Turns out that the construction took over a year and a half because they ran into supply issues and they had to like labor issues and just ev basically everything that could have gone wrong in the construction um, project happened to this one. They were moving people to all the different hotels and having to now do shuttles. And it was like, it was crazy. It was crazy. You know, it, when, um, that was one of the pieces of advice I used to give people is whenever you're looking at a venue, ask, you know, and it, we think we do this, but you'd be surprised how many people don't is like, are you doing any renovations? Are you okay. doing, you know, when is your time expectation? And come on, anyone who's ever had anything done at their house knows it's going to take longer. You know, so you put it on the scale of a hotel or a convention center, it's going to take a lot longer. And do you want to be there for it? Or do you want to be holding your breath that it is or isn't going to be ready when you go in? And I, I think that's huge. That and, you know, when do your if you have unions, when do your contracts run out? Yep. Um which this is going to be an interesting conversation in the next couple of months about unions and strikes in our industry. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, yeah. But you I know. also, I tell the students to also be asking, um, what is the makeup of the staff? Are they full-time? Are they part-time? How long have they been there? Yeah, that's one because of mine. Because the length of time that's, that a member has been there is going to indicate how well management treats them, which means that they're going to be a, a strong you're going to end up with stronger service yep yep yeah the staffs that actually think or feel i should say think is insulting but feel it is it is their hotel yeah. i love meeting those people you know they've been there 17 years 25 years yeah. 35 years i love talking to them they're so yeah. awesome just yeah yeah Okay, so we we are now tagging strategies with our plan B, C, and D. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yes. what what then? So once you've done that, again, you're not. What you're doing is you're putting these strategies. So now, again, we've got this big funnel that we started with with our our risk individual risk perception, then the identification, then we kind of combine things together to assess them. Now we put strategies on them. Now we need to go through that list and see what type of, and I call them action plans, um, we need to create. So like I said, an action plan is, doesn't matter how good you are, risks are going to manifest. They're, they're going to happen. Uh, so action plans are, what do we do when a risk manifests? And I intentionally chose the, the phrase action plan because when I was going through my research, it was emergency plan, disaster plan, and it was like, why are you using scary words, right? <laughs> why can't we just say action plan? And so now I'm handing to volunteers this document that says action plan. It empowers them. It makes them feel stronger versus emergency disaster. You know, <laughs> like, it just, to me, seemed like such a crazy thing to do. So, Well, and not everything is an emergency and a disaster, but correct. it is something we need to address. Correct. So, um, for an action plan, at a bare minimum, 
you should always have evacuation, stay in place, and medical. You should have those three for sure. Um, and they can be adapted, and you shouldn't be making those in and, of, in, your, in and of yourself. So, Meg, you have a venue. You probably have an evacuation and stay in place plan. Why would I recreate it? Right? <laughs> like, why wouldn't I come to you and say, do you have one? Do you have these two? Great. Can I see them? And I'm not sharing them with anybody else, but I, I want to see them because then we can have a discussion so I can be sure if we have to get people out or keep people in, I know what you're going to do. And so I can piggyback on that. Or I may see something and go, have you ever thought of? <laughs> right? And, and so it, it, it's stupid to not work with your venue or facility to, to talk to them. And you should be talking to all your supplier partners because if you've got F&B on site, you got to get them out too, right? Meg, do you, do you all share your um, your action plans with your clients? If they yeah, ask, we, <laughs> does anyone ask? And to piggyback on that, you know, it's important because we know our property and we know the area and we know th what services are available, but we also may not know what attendees have um, disabilities that need to be considered an evacuation or you know, there's a lot of things that the planner probably knows, you know, who needs special assistance and things like that that we may not know. And and also a venue may not have thought about that, in, which I'm going to go look now, in there. How do we, what is our plan for people that have mobility um, disabilities or sight disabilities or hearing, anything that would factor in them getting out or getting safe? Yes. Know, yeah. Do you have a stay in place plan? Do you know along with an evacuation plan? Uh, you know what? I'm not sure. And now I'm going to check because it, like, just sitting here in my office thinking, what do I do? Yeah. You know, yeah. if if something did happen, I, I don't know what yeah. I'm supposed to do, and I should. I mean, it's common for venues to have an evacuation plan, but not a stay in place. Because that's kind again, of a new thing, really, in is, the past, I don't is. know, 10 years, 15 years. Yeah. The schools had them before anywhere else had them, sadly. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I mean, it's not, it's not something that is really common. Most times you are focused on evacuation, right? Most times you have to get out. Um, and as I mentioned, and I think it was the first podcast, the other piece is that if there's a big catastrophe that venues then become the shelter in place for the the first responders so they will typically come in and do it um but it, it isn't it meg it's not common to have a, a stay in place and yeah. again i use i use the term stay in place versus shelter in place but you should people should be very aware that if you say if you say stay in place first responders won't necessarily know what that means so you do want to, I use the stay in place because shelter to me, again, being an English and history uh, background, shelter implies danger. So I'm trying to take the emotional words, anything that could potentially trigger a fear response, I'm trying to take that out of what my staff sees or my team sees. So that's why I use stay in place versus shelter in place. But you do need to understand that if you're talking to first responders that you need to use shelter in place. So those are the ones that you absolutely need to have, those three. What's the third? I'm sorry. Medical. Evacuation. Medical. What is Medical. it? Medical. Medical. Yeah. So if an injury happens, what do we do? And that can that consists of, you know, how do we who do we call? It's Ghostbusters, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also how they're gonna get in and out of the location, right? So do they have hallways big enough, doorways big enough? Do they come through the loading dock, right? Like all of those pieces. If you're up on a higher floor, are the are the elevators big enough to get emergency personnel in and out, right? So all of those pieces is what we need to think of. Um, you also want to look at, and I said again in one of the earlier podcasts that for um, for your volunteers, looking for somebody who has any kind of um, 
training as a first responder or what I found was lifeguards, right? They've been trained. They have some medical training. Uh, Those are people that are really great to have on your team because they've been trained to deal with this type of a situation. Um, I used to be trained in first aid and CPR. I no longer am. I was also trained in infant CPR and first aid initially. Um, I'm no longer trained. Because I'm uncomfortable with having to use those skills on site. And if I know that I feel uncomfortable about it, then in a situation that it has some kind of crisis or panic around it, I may not be able to do what I need to. So, again, you need to look at your strengths, your challenges, what you can and cannot do, and be brutally honest so that you are using your resources in the most effective way. That's a good point. You need to be being the the planner or whatever, not the person doing the medical. Right. Because you're having to look bigger picture. Right. So in terms of action plans, what you're going to want to do, so typically we have an action plan. If we're using a retained strategy, we're likely going to have an action plan attached to it. And remember, a retained strategy is, when we know something could happen, but we can't really predict whether or not it's going to. So that that's when we typically have to have a plan to deal with it. <clears throat> so as a general rule, retain, stra- retain risks are going to have an action plan. Those action plans will be able to be adapted to other types of risks that manifest. Um, and what I suggest when you're doing an action plan is that it is as simple as you can make it and as detailed step by step. Um, We want to be as concise and clear as we can. So on the action plan, you would put the probability and severity levels um, and the reasonable worst case scenario so that people understand why you created an action plan. Then you would put the risk, you would put the risk that it's associated with. So again, you could do evacuation, stay in place, or medical. Um, In my book, I included a lost child, an action plan for a lost child, um, because it was for that educational event that I did uh, in southern Ontario in September at an outdoor venue surrounded on three sides by water, somewhere between seven or 200 and, and 1,500 students coming, or kids coming. So... I mean, of course, they could get lost. And what do you do? So that's what's in the book. And what you'll see is that it has what I call triggers. And triggers are our early warning system. So they're telling you that the risk might manifest, which then allows you to end run it, to stop it from happening, or implement the action plan that much quicker, right? So for a lost child, Um, you could see a child standing off by themselves, right? So you're going to approach the child and avoid that. Like what you're trying to do is stop it from happening. Um, You could see uh, a bunch of kids in in a large area. You could see some fighting. There's a variety of different types of triggers. But again, this is our early warning system. Um, And so, again, we either try to avoid the risk from manifesting or we implement the action plan that much quicker because there's times where 30 seconds can make a difference. Um, And then you break it down in terms of who's responsible for what. And this is, again, where you have to be really, really brutally honest and have your team be brutally honest as well. So I like to use um, what I call team leaders. So I would be the planner and or risk manager Um, In my ideal world, there would be a risk manager at every event. Um, I also understand that my ideal world has rainbows and unicorns. Um, So it's not likely to happen in the immediate future. Uh, But you're going to have somebody identified as responsible for the risk management plan. It doesn't have to be the person that wrote it, right? So if, if you as a planner decide to write this risk management plan and great, but you don't feel comfortable implementing it, then you tag somebody else and you get them to do it. Uh, and so everybody's got a hierarchy. So you've got your event planner, you've got your client at the very top, then you've got the event planner, 
the risk manager, the team leaders, and depending on the number of volunteers, you'd have a variety of different team leaders, different numbers, and then the volunteers would be assigned to each team leader. So for the educational event that I did, I had 20 students, I had four team leaders, and each of them had four volunteers that were, that were connected to them. So it, that then allows it because, again, working with volunteers, I don't know who they are, right? Even putting a, a, some type of moniker on them doesn't necessarily let me know who they are. And talking to 20 people versus talking to four, it's, you're going to have a stronger communication. Um, and each of these team leaders were assigned a section. I, they had a map, and I just made <laughs> a, a four sections out of it. I just drew lines on it and said, here's, what your, here's the area that you're responsible for if we have to put the action plan, if we have to put any action plan into effect. And they would then be working with the volunteers in that area, and that was their space to be responsible for. So everybody had a job. Everybody knew who they reported to uh, because you also want to be careful that you're not having people talk to media or give out information that isn't the right information, right? We want one story, one voice. I so, want to jump in I, for one second yeah. and just make the point to people because in case they're going, oh, well, we don't have volunteers and we don't have that same concept though that that chart and graph of how people are answering to and everything can yeah. be applied to any staff and it may be a mixture of your staff, the hotel staff, et cetera. But you know, don't yes. don't tune out on this because she's talking about a volunteer group. So No. Everybody on site has a job. If an action plan has to be put into effect it's all hands. So you share your risk management plan with your supplier partners because they also have a job to do. So yes, staff, Especially the volunteers, venue. anybody that is involved in the execution of the event is now yours to use in the, in the event that you have to implement an action plan. And you should take all hands. Because think about supplier partners. So you've got somebody, again, at this at children's event, there were vendors that were supplying F and B. Well, why wouldn't I go and use them as well? Because where are these kids going to go? They're going to go and try to get some food. You know, they might wander off to do this. There's, you know, there's a variety of different things. So it's all hands when you have to implement a, a an action plan or any kind of risk management. You can't have too many hands involved at that point. But as you said, Joanne, you need to have a communication hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Without it, it all goes to hell. Right? Which is what happened when you look at the astral world. That's what happened. The more I dug into astral world and what happened, the more I realized that the key piece from what I read, the key piece was there was no communication. And that's why things fell apart the way they did. Um, but yeah, so with the action plan, with the lost child, you also have to detail out Again, step by step, what each person is doing. So in the book, I, I write it all out, what they're responsible to do, who they're supposed to talk to. And you also put it in the order that they're supposed to do it. Because again, you've got people who are implementing an action plan. You don't necessarily know how comfortable they're going to be until it happens. And when you're talking about for the one that I created was a lost child and the volunteers who are 16, 17 years old, now have to look for this lost child. I'm not screwing around with that. I'm telling you exactly step by step what you need to do and, and when and how. So you have codes. First thing that you do is for a lost child, comes across the radio, whoever realizes that there's a lost child, comes across the radio, lost child, you immediately switch to a new channel. You've got your emergency channel. And the first thing that the risk manager does is lock the place down. Nobody goes in or out at that point, right? Because the lost child could be a, an abduction of some sort, right? So nobody goes in and out. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is that you're calling the police, right? To let them know that this has happened and that you've implemented the action plan that you shared with them early, right? And at that point, then you run down how and what each person is supposed to be doing. So... In the plan, the T 
team members, so the rest of the staff, their job was to keep everybody at the activity that they were, that they were um, visiting when it was called. Because you can't search for a lost child if people are moving around, right? You can't account for them all. Mm. So, again, it's, there, is, there, is there stuff within that action plan that you might change? Absolutely. This is the one that when I created it, this made sense to me. Uh, that action plan was also created prior to cell phones. We didn't have them at that point. So uh, there are some things that you could add. The, the schools didn't, they, again, very, very small town in southern Ontario. You didn't have, like I was assigned, or the parents were assigned the children that day. There's no waivers. There's no lists, right? So things have changed. Fingers crossed, things change a lot of times. So I was operating from a position of, I'm not going to have a list. I'm not going to be able to call the, the child's parents, right? Like, I, I'm, all I know is that there's a lost child. And so how do I deal with that? And then the other part of it is, you, you keep doing this. The, what happens is the team leaders are sweeping their area over and over and over. And every time they get through their area, they report in found, not found. But you also have to have what we call a recovery plan. So they're going to keep doing that until the police show up on site and relieve them. Right? It's the same as if you're applying any kind of first aid or CPR. You keep doing it until the first responder gets there. Um, so they keep doing their sweeps. But then what do you do if you find the child and the child is injured and or dead? What do you do? So, and, you, and you have to think about all of these different consequences because you want to prepare your team as best you can. Because you're saying to them, you could, it's surrounded on three sides by water. That kid could have wandered into the water, Right. It's at a fall fair where they're still setting it up. The kid, something could have fallen on the child, right? So what do you do? You, if you can, safely remove them to the, from the danger. This is where they need to have some medical training, right? To know whether or not you, have to, you can remove them and what you have to do. And sharing that information then lets your team say, no, I can't do that. Like, no, I, I can't do that. Okay, cool, who can? Right? So... You want to make sure that your team has as much information as they can about what they're going to have to do in the action plan so that they can make an informed decision as to whether or not they can actually do that. And it's not a pleasant thing to talk about, but you do a disservice to people if you don't think about it. I, thankfully, touch wood, have never had an injury on site that I've had to deal with. Um, but I'm, not, I'm aware that it could happen. So that's a nice, warm, fuzzy thought. Yeah, really. <laughs> that's as we're all sitting here going, "Yep." Yeah, but you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm sure all of us have met people who have had people die at the events, or you know, I know I have in a variety of different ways. Yeah. Um, and and that leads me to I remember two key things I was taught kind of at the beginning is one, you try to, if at all possible, isolate the incident from everyone else. Um, and, and at the time, the example that was being given a lot was like, there were a lot of atrium hotels. Eventually, they changed a lot of their, you know, decor around the atrium because there were a lot of jumpers. And that was a huge, huge problem. And I talked to someone who had it happen, not one of his people. Most of the jumpers aren't even guests in the hotels. But just like... You know, and that's when I learned that most of the benches had blankets underneath of them so you could, you know, cover the body and, and keep going. I just remember sitting there in shock and going, okay, these are not things I would have thought of in my wildest dreams, but I just remember being told, isolate the incident, try to cut it off from the, you know, the rest of the attendees, the rest, because it yep. will just create more panic. It will create, you know, um, just things you don't want them to have to experience right. and everything. So right. I think about that a lot. Like, how do I keep people away from what has happened, if at all possible? You know, so I think about that a lot. Um, and the other thing I think of, which I don't think we do a good job, most people of thinking of, is something happens. 
who takes to the stage or the microphone or, you know, right. the over voice, voiceover, um, to say what is appropriate to be said and what the action will be taken. In other words, are we evacuating? Right. Are we staying in place? Are we, you know, and I think that falls a lot of the time. And I think in some cases it might be the meeting professional. Other times it may be a leader in the organization, but I think it has to be thought out 100%. as to who makes the official announcement that yep. we're doing this or we're not doing this or we're doing something different. Do you have any yes. thoughts on that? A hundred percent. You hundred percent need to have the voice of the event, right? Regardless of whether it's because a risk is manifested or if it's information that attendees need, right? Like you have to have somebody that's speaking for the event. That from my perspective needs to be a discussion with the client because it's their event, right? Um, and you may have to, you may have to convince them. Um, and if they don't have somebody, then you find somebody, but you a hundred percent need someone who's going to be the voice of the event. Yeah. My action plan has uh, a communication plan, which has scripts even. Yep. It has a, like, who's going to talk to who and what they're going to say specifically what you're going to say. If we're having this issue, this is what you say, you know, to yeah. in each category got to have yeah. it because no, you're not going to be able to think sometimes what am i going to say right now it's right. right here don't you don't have to worry about it just stay right, right. on this paper right here yep. yep yeah exactly it's the same idea as when you're detailing out the action plan again the one in the book has what words are being used right when they're being used um, but if you need to evacuate you need to have it written down because what if the what if your event voice is part of the risk right <laughs> like yeah who's somebody the else second? has to be able to do it <laughs> It's the same as, you know, uh, the risk manager. Everybody should have a backup, right? Yep. Everybody, should be able to, everybody should be able to pick up that piece of paper and do it. Whether or not they want to is, is a whole other discussion. But that risk management plan has to be implemented, right? And so everybody has to be comfortable enough to do it. And there has to be, like, not only who's going to be the voice of the event, but who's their backup and who's their backup and all the way down. Well, I'm thinking also like, and I think I read about someone doing this, you know, with cell phones and social media, you don't want people posting outside what is going nope. on. And I'm pretty sure I read about one where they basically closed down the internet. So people couldn't, couldn't do that because it was going to escalate the problem. Yeah. God, the, I can't remember the who first that was. Responders, first responders can actually block cell towers. And so they, they can do that. The police can block it. Which is also why you want to write your plan so you're not relying on your cell phone. You need a radio or you need some other form of communication. Yeah. And, and your binder. Want, everything's printed in your binder. Yeah. Binders. Yes. Binders will never binders, go away. Binders. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, at the very, very least, the risk management plan has to be in a hard copy form, at least yeah. one, if not more. Yep. You know, like it, you absolutely have to have. Absolutely. Right, I, and I would, I would even say that you need at least two copies of it because what if somebody spills coffee on one? <laughs> or what if right? it's at the other end of the building where the emergencies occurred and nobody Correct. can get to it? Or Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the best, the best written risk management plan is not going to be helpful if you can't access it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and you just cannot always, and it's not my age, people, it's experience. You cannot always use technology. It does not, right. especially in the case of an emergency, right. work. So, right. And we, talk, we talked about it the, in one of the other sessions as well. It's like you've got your cell phone. My cell phone, I've got one of those uh, Motorola flip phones. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, like to find something, if I don't have my glasses, I can't read it. Mm -hmm. And now I have to, I'm scooching through it to try to find the section versus opening a binder. And, and it's got a tab on it. Like, cool. This is where I'm going. Yeah. Right? It would say evacuation plan. Great. This is what I need. Right. So, yeah, you want to be able to access it quickly. You know, I went to, um, it was actually PCMA about five years ago. And one of the things they did that I've never seen done at any other conference, not to say no one else is doing, but no conference I went to, at least an industry one or something, 
an opening session. They did an overview and they did it for other reasons, but I'm thinking, ooh, it was a good risk maneuver though too. They did like an aerial map of the convention center to say, okay, and over here's our whatever cute, clever thing they called the technology thing. And over here is there, but I'm thinking... For me, and most of us are so visual, it like gave me an idea of what direction. So in case of risk and someone said, okay, this is over here, we're going over here. Yeah. Um, like you understand how the building is put together or something. Um, so I think that's great. I, I thought I, it was brilliant, I, personally. I think yeah. I can't believe we don't do it at more meetings and conferences. I, I mean, something as simple as uh, one of my former professors, Ty, uh, Tyra Warner, she was the one that introduced me to the idea of when you open the event, you you do your flight attendant. Yeah, like the doors are here, and he, like here's how you get your butts out of here. Uh, and so I do I do that whenever I'm speaking. Yep, uh, is like just so you know, we're going to start out. Here are your exits. Yep, right. Um, and I think even if you're not a visual learner, I think that type of visual is so much so important because. I, I am geographically challenged. If you tell me go west, I'm like, what? Um, but I also have an issue as like, okay, you go out these doors, you turn left, you walk down to the third door, and then you turn right and you do this. By the third thing, I'm now, I can't, I can't retain any more. And that's without being in a situation that I'm stressed. So, right? So a map, I'm like, cool, I'm walking I got my map. And I'm we, walking with my map. <laughs> in the one in the podcast we did, uh, in fact, Meg was on it uh, with Brendan Mahan, uh, where we talked about ADD, ADHD, and other neurodiverse. We got in a long conversation about marking, like creating wayfinders in hotels and especially convention centers. Because I said, "Oh heck, I get you know." They'll say, "Oh, go to one ten F." K L M yeah. because the way they divide up the the letters aren't even together and and right. we talked about the effect of people with uh, you know different kinds of neurodiversity how hard that would be like you said you're walking down those endless halls and you don't see anything so I think oh, that's yeah. something that probably would help with a lot of safety issues too is having I these agree. wayfinders where people know where they are in the convention center. Yeah, I mean, signage is something that I cover in one of my classes. And, and again, I'm a fan of you would put the name of the conference on a piece of paper, you put it in a plastic sleeve, and you hang it six feet high with arrows. <laughs> like that's, and you use it like, and you do it like you're going hiking. So trail markers, mm -hmm. you should be able to see the next one from the one you're standing at. I can get lost with my GPS, mm -hmm. right? I do it all the time. And so I, I, we used to joke when I was working for, um, as a planner that I would be the one that would be sent to the venue because then I would write the directions that were so idiot proof that nobody else got lost because if there was any way to get lost, I would find it. See, you brought a whole strength to the, <laughs> to the situation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Meg and Kelly and Tracy, do you have any other closing questions, comments? Because, yes, we know we can go on, um, yes. but uh, I'm afraid we'll, uh, no. Uh, people, remember, they're podcasts. You can turn them on and turn them <laughs> off. You don't have to watch, listen to them all at the same time. Like, people keep going, oh, well, I have it. I'm like, so listen to it 10 minutes at a time, people. Anyway, point being, do any of the three of you have questions or comments that you want to put? Meg's still back on her moose and her... <laughs> <laughs> and they're staying in place. <laughs> um, just real quick, I was uh, traveling recently and I sat on an airplane next to a guy who happened to be, he worked in risk management. I'm like, what is risk management in me lately? I was like, seriously. Um, but he worked for a company who comes in and does the risk for you. So not only do they do the assessment, they will bring a team on site. So they'll have the medical and they'll have the security and they'll have people watching where they're like, I've never had a, met a company that does that before. Oh, there's so I thought that was fascinating. They weren't yeah. out of Philly, were they? Were they out of Philadelphia? I can't remember. I have the cards at home. I'm, I'm at the office. Um, but I had never heard of that before. Yeah, I, there's... It's got to cost a pretty penny. Uh, I, I mean, it'd be worth it though, too. Yeah. Um, to, and that's the other thing is assessing whether or not you're bringing um, first responders or anybody, medical, whatever, security, whether or not you're bringing them on site or having them just on a speed dial, 
right? That's another thing because they are expensive. Um, I haven't heard of one that's that extensive. I've heard of like security companies that will bring, uh, you know, maybe somebody with medical training, but I haven't heard it to that extent, which is sounds really cool. I'll look up. Uh, you would the gentleman who's the CEO of this one in Philadelphia, who's actually a medical doctor, an MD, who somehow ended up in charge of this, but it, he was he spoke at um, an MPI New England conference maybe about seven, eight years ago. He shifted how I looked at some of these things like, no, it's not your department's risk plan or communication plan. It's the companies. And, and he did this thing with us where he pulled the legal person out of the communication. Okay, what are you going to do now? You know, yeah. and he walked us through. I mean, they're the kind that like your CEO got kidnapped and thrown in the trunk of his car in another country. What are we going to do? Um, but he did a completely very, very diverse. And that's what they do. They deal. They work with organizations with all kinds of security and and risk components. Yeah. And uh, like you, Tracy, I was like, what? Really? Amazing. It, it just it's very eye opening that these companies, yeah. you know, very, very cool. Um, just to, uh, on, on, in September, MPI New England, what we're doing for our educational program is on risk management, and we've got a nurse coming in. Um, we're also going to have somebody that's in charge of security at one of the hotels, and we're going to have a lawyer come in, and it's going to be very hands-on talking about, from these three aspects of risk management, what do you do? Um, and the nurse is actually going to offer first-come, first-serve certifications for people if they want it. Wow. Yeah. I also had a venue refuse to share their evacuation plans with me. Yeah, very, sorry, very frustrating. Happens. So frustrating. It's like, well, I have a hundred volunteers who would be more than willing to help evacuate people to get, you know, as fast as possible. Yeah. I, I can't, t what do I tell them what to do? Yeah. Like, how do I, I mean, obviously you're going to find the closest door, but if you have a plan with little arrows, it would be so much easier for me to just send that to my people rather than trying to whip up something on my own that could be uh, different than what you have. Can I just have, I'm not going to put it on the internet. It's not for public, you know, what if, you what, do you do? Just, what, what if you do put it on the internet? Like, why is that? Why is the evacuation? Yeah, what's the big deal? Right. <laughs> well, the big uh, issue after 9-11, I remember when people started asking properties for this, the reality was they didn't, they didn't have, have one. one. They were like, oh, no, that's confidential. We got to keep that. You know, we don't want anyone. Yeah. And it's like, they hadn't done one. They hadn't done one, and that became... I think, I think they all have, like, a fire evacuation. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's part and parcel of uh, any kind of, like, safety. But, yeah, an evacuation plan for anything other than a fire, no. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It, and, again, with risk management, uh, you have to be careful about what you share because you don't want to create this risk management plan, and then it gets shared, and then the bad people... Can circumvent it, right? Yep. So, oh, sure. it's, it's not that you're it's not that you're hiding things. You're just trying to make sure that things stay safe. But yeah, I'm I'm surprised that venues. I, I would be surprised if venues still do that. It's it's so dumb. Yeah. Meg, anything you want to say? To you? <laughs> I, you know, I'm going back to my CMP background, and I have I have a few planners usually with you know like a financial company or something along that lines and maybe higher up um legal uh like courts county courts things like that that do ask for that but it really probably should be in every meeting professionals rfp mm -hmm. yep but it and this, i've kind of been preaching risk management for many many years because it's not something that people think about but you know, at the very least, you should know if the property has one or not. Yeah. Again, I'm always surprised. The first thing that I know when I go somewhere is how to get out. Right? <laughs> and how to get out in multiple ways. Right? Um, it, it does make me uncomfortable at Endicott, the classrooms that I teach in. You can only get in and out by one door, and the door opens out. So there's no way for me to secure it. Um, and if there's, I mean, if there's an active shooter, I cannot secure the room, right? Um, and so it makes, it does make me feel very uncomfortable when I think about that. But, you know, wh again, why do you not know how to get in and out? It's your, it's your responsibility, Tracy, like you were saying, 
you're doing this event, you're responsible for the attendees. You, you need to get them out. Yeah. And I've got the people there to do it. I just need to know where you want them to go. Yes. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> Oh, well, yes. Well, we'll have to revisit this sometime in a few months. <laughs> Something will have happened that makes us go, hey, that would be yeah. really good to analyze a part on uh, yeah. on the podcast. Like, our, our, I'm certainly hoping nothing horrible, please. <laughs> you know, no. but sometimes it's the more... It's the more basic ones. It's the confusion, you know. Who has the right to tell everyone to evacuate? The venue or the planner? I mean... My rule is, if the alarm goes off, we're evacuating. I really don't give a damn what the venue says. Right. We're evacuating. And that that's a 9-11 thing that, you know, well, even before that, when I worked in colleges yeah. and universities, but after 9-11, I'm like, I don't really care who says stay. <laughs> we're not. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're not. not. Yeah. I've actually had it when I used to have the face-to-face -face, uh, CMP classes, I've had alarms go off. Always seemed to be the days that we had that topic, too. It was very interesting. <laughs> it was, uh, no, I really did not plan this, people. Really did not. Well, anyway, well, thank you, all of you. Linda, thanks for all your time um, on these three podcasts. And, uh, you know, all of you for jumping in and um, there's so much good information here and for all the people who are going, oh, well, I don't have time to sit down and do it. This is exactly why you need to be listening to the podcast because it will <laughs> at least get you going in little steps. I mean, yeah. it's not going to be perfect the first run. And if you're like me, it's like, okay, I'm going to put this day aside and I'm going to write the entire risk plan. And it's like, no, 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 no. Kelly and I were just having a conversation about this, that I have a tendency to do this that you know and it's like no you really got to chip it away like an hour here 15 minutes there you know because otherwise you'll never do it so um linda thank you very much for those of you who are listening if you haven't already located linda's book kelly being the wonderful amazing person that she is will make sure that all the book information is listed with the three um episodes of the podcast Highly recommend it. Um, Tracy and I uh, both have read it. Uh, Kelly and Meg, I believe, are in the process of it. But, you know, it's going to take you like an hour and a half, depending on your speed of reading, probably between an hour or two hours of reading. So, and not to say that it's any shortcuts. It's just very direct and very understandable and very readable. Um, so, highly recommend uh, doing that. And if you ever see Linda speaking at any of the conferences you're going to, highly recommend you going in and, and listening. Um, so, well, with that in mind, we will wrap this up. And thank you so much for spending the time with us. And we will see you on the next episode of Sit in the Attendees Chair. Bye. <laughs>